If you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, I like preaching from this chapter quite a bit. It's dealing with a profound theme throughout the entirety of the chapter, dealing with the lost. And really, when you think about the three the parables presented here, it deals with God's attitude towards the lost, but also how man can react towards the lost. And in particular, as it relates to the Pharisees and the scribes, and they viewed Christ as the man who receives sinners and eateth with them, with him. They didn't understand that Christ was concerned about their spiritual well-being. He did not pay those sinners a social call, but rather he was there to teach them. And certainly these parables were presented to these scribes and Pharisees to impress upon them an important point, the salvation of lost souls. And certainly it impresses upon us that same lesson today as well. We think about Luke chapter 15, though, the, the, most, the parable we're all most familiar with is the final one, parable of the prodigal son, or we might call it the parable of the two sons. It has a lot of powerful lessons for, it, for us. I've preached, preached this section of Scripture up and down. I've preached three different lessons from it. This is the fourth one I've preached from it tonight. As we think about it tonight, though, I want us to think about it from the standpoint of the Father relating to God. One of the basic causes as to why men reject God is a misunderstanding of who God is. It is vitally important that we have a correct view and involved in having a correct view of God is a balanced view of God. Romans chapter 11 and verse number 22, the Apostle Paul in writing to the church at Rome said, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. There is no doubt that God is a good God, but He is also a severe God because He is holy, He is just, He is righteous. Whereas when we think about sin, sin is opposite of holy. It is unholy. It is unrighteousness. It is unjust. It is a direct affront against God. God cannot bear with sin. Ultimately, God will punish sin. And hence, some men reject God because they have this preconceived notion, how could such a good and loving God punish anyone? Whereas it's really not God's fault because God does not desire the death of the wicked. We talked about that a couple of Sunday mornings ago. It's not God's desire that the wicked perish. It's not God's desire that any man should suffer the brunt of his wrath. But if men persist in sin, they will, and the Bible makes it crystal clear. Israel of old was given opportunity after opportunity to repent, to turn back to God, and they refused. They refused the goodness, the long-suffering of God, and as a result, they had to deal with the severity of God. Many cannot fathom how God could send anyone to hell. But again, it is not God who sends people to hell. It is man who sends himself there, is it not, by the choices that he makes in this life. If man makes the choice to live unrighteously, it is not God's fault because God has erected roadblocks on the highway to hell to keep man from going there. Many believe, though, that God takes delight in that. Still, there are those who believe that God does not care for them. And then still, on the other hand, there are those that view themselves as not worthy of being saved or forgiven. Tonight, as we think about God, as we think about how we view God, again, we affirm that God is a just God. He is a righteous God and a holy God. There's no doubt about that. But tonight, I want us to focus on the goodness of God as it relates to mankind. How that God does not want anyone to perish. And I want us to look at this from the standpoint of the actions of the Father depicted in the parable, and really get a glimpse, a, a true picture, a biblical snapshot, as it were, 
of God the Father's feelings towards mankind. And God is our Father because He created us in His own image. He is, he is the Father of our spirits and, spirits and that He formed our spirits within us. But above all, more importantly, He desires fellowship with His creation. He desires an intimate relationship with us as it were. A special relationship with His spiritual progeny. Israel of old, under the Mosaical co Covenant, was God's chosen people then. He was their father. He was, they were His children. But today, He has a different people. And those are Christians. Those who have been born of water and of the Spirit. Who have died to sin. They've been born into God's family. Adopted into the family of God. We take on the family name of Christ. Christian. And remember, if you don't have Christ, remember the words I A in the letters. I ain't nothing. God wants this relationship with all creation. With all mankind. And that is why we need to present to all this complete picture of God as Father. Indeed, we present to Him, to people, as a righteous God, as a holy God. But yet, on the other hand as well, we present to them the fact that God loves them. That He does not want them to perish eternally. And I want us to see this picture from the standpoint of this parable. Tonight as we look at the parable of the prodigal and elder sons found here in Luke chapter 15, we're going to glean four vital characteristics. There are four points I want us to consider from the Father depicted in the parable which demonstrate to us God the Father's concern and true will for mankind today. What He, what he desires for all mankind. What He wants to do for all mankind. We want to stress and demonstrate from our study that God is not some cruel, merciless, tyrannical father who simply desires to punish the wicked for all the bad, that is, the sin they do. Rather, though, though he is righteous, though he is holy, though he is just, though he will ultimately punish all sin, he is a loving and gracious father that desires what is best for us. And that is our salvation from the far country of sin. And thus restoration to a proper relationship with Him as demonstrated by the prodigal being restored and reconciled to His Father in the parable. And so tonight, as we think about a biblical snapshot of God our Father, the picture we glean of Him in the parable given here by His Son, His only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ, is number one, from verses 11 through 19, God is a teaching Father. We understand that teaching is accomplished in a variety of ways. Obviously, God teaches us today through His Word. But also, as you study His Word, we, you find that God had oftentimes used object lessons to convey important lessons. And certainly we can employ these same things today as well, not just in preaching the Word of God, but in educating others, whatever the topic may be. Silence can be a powerful teaching tool. You know you ever get in trouble when you're a kid and your, your dad was upset and he just didn't want, he didn't say a word to you? That's when you're thinking, uh-oh. But also in connection with that, we learn or we're taught by the choices that we make. However, I suggest to you that some of the most effective lessons are learned when nothing is said at all. Remember the old song, you say it best when you say, it, say nothing at all? Sometimes some of the best lessons are learned when nothing is said at all. And sometimes, as we're going to find out, the consequences of our choices really are a way of God instructing us. Think about it. Think about what the son learned here in the parable. And really think about how the father taught his son here by really permitting him, allowing him to make his choice to leave. And, and that's what you see in verses 12 and 13. He made the conscientious decision that he did not want to stay at home. 
He was itching to get away. Hence he made the request of his father to give me my, the portion of goods that it falleth to me. And the father, loving as he was, did, it, did, as, he, he did as, as he was asked. You think about this. The father did not lecture his son. Well, son, you don't need to go away. Or, you know, I don't want you to go away or I'm not going to allow you to go away. It's, you're going to get into so much trouble out there. He didn't keep him from going. He allowed him to go. How does this relate to God, the Father, today? Remember how God created us as rational beings with the ability to think, to decide, to choose. God is not going to forcibly stop us from doing what we decide to do. If we decide to, go, to sin, He's not going to say, you, you know, hold it right there. You don't need to do that. That's wrong. That would violate our free will. He's not going to violate our free will even if we make bad choices as the son did here in the parable. He's just going to let us go right ahead with those bad choices. You think about the experience that the son had. Life was not easy away from the father and from home. At first he had what he wanted. When you look at verse 13, he, he had... He had his freedom. Oh, how it is when we are younger. I remember being a teenager at home. You know, Daddy, why don't you let me do this? I want, to be, I want more freedom. And I remember my, father, my dad telling me, Son, as long as you slide your feet under my table, you're going to abide by my rules. Knew what was best for me. So many young people think that, that they have it made out in the world. I've got, I've got it made, freedom. I'm free from my parents. And yet, what happens when they get out into the free world? Well, then that's when real life smacks them in the face. It's not as easy as they think. He had money. He had, he had friends. But yet, look what he did. He wasted his substance with riotous living. In a sense, I can relate to this myself because I remember growing up as a younger man, I worked for my dad part-time while trying to go to school. Made pretty good money working in the bakery for an 18, 19-year-old. But you know what I did with my money instead of saving it? I squandered it. That money burned a hole in my pockets. And, you know, for 19, 20-year-olds, I was getting bank overdrafts about every other week for a while there. I was irresponsible. Eventually I learned a lesson. I opened a savings account and kept back most of my paycheck to go into savings so I couldn't get to it. But how much better off would I have been if I had just been responsible with what I had? A lot better off. This young man went into the far country and he, he just wasted everything he had. But again, due to his personal choices. And notice what happened, verse 14. He began to be in want due to, the, due to the rise of a famine, a mighty famine. Became destitute. In need of everything because he lost everything. Then you look at verse 15. Because he was in want, he was desperate. He went and joined himself to a citizen and he went into his fields to feed the swine. He hit rock bottom. Because we're told in verse 16, he had nothing to eat and he wanted to fill his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. No man gave it unto him. He bottomed out, did he not, in the pig pen. Not a pretty picture. This is what the far country does to an individual. You could preach a powerful sermon, and this just came to my mind right now as I'm thinking about this verse, living in the pig pen of sin. Oh, if all men would really recognize the folly, the foolishness of the mire, the filth that sin brings. However, though, he came to himself. He... He recognized finally that, you know, I didn't have it so bad at home. Things weren't that bad at home. 
Did his father tell him that? Well, no. How did he come to recognize this? Well, he learned it. Well, what taught him this basic lesson? Well, wasn't this, these hardships, didn't this hardship teach him that life was far better at home, that he was foolish for, for drifting away? He learned he needed home. He learned he needed his family, that he needed his father. Oh, how I wish all men would come to re recognize their need for God, their need for Christ, their need for the Word of God, their need for the precious cleansing blood of Christ today. Because they're missing out on a relationship they need, fellowship with God. Salvation from sin, which results in fellowship with God because that, the burden of sin is snapped, it's broken, it's destroyed. They need it. The son certainly recognized that, and thus, verse 19, he, he resolved to go home. Verses 18 and 19, I'm going to arise. I'm getting out of this mess. I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Every person tonight, no matter where they are, they're not a faithful Christian, needs to have this recognition. You see, the application of all this is this. Sometimes the choices we make in this life can serve to remind us that life is not better separate and apart from God. You know, the hard knock experiences of life away from God, that is, the consequences we may experience as a result of bad choices, teach us of the need to turn to God. Certainly there are lessons in life that men, ourselves included, can or will only learn the hard way. And sometimes that's what it takes, is to learn things the hard way. And certainly this prodigal son did. He learned how foolish it was to go away from his home, to go away from his father, to go away from the security, the blessings he had enjoyed. And into the far country, the hard way. And sometimes it takes men learning the hard way of the foolishness and folly of engaging in the pleasures of sin. But number two, God is a forgiving Father. The Father is ready and willing to forgive. He, he's eager to forgive. But as we're going to note here, something had to happen. And it wasn't on the part of the Father. You think about how the prodigal was received. Again, as we noted, there was repentance. Verses 17 through 20. In verse 20 in particular, he had a change in mind which led to a change in conduct. Again, the actions of the prodigal son here are, are a textbook case of repentance. Of turning away from his, his past condition and turning towards what he needed to do. But then you think about how the, how the father reacted, verse 20, when he saw his father coming. That's the key, po key point. The son came home. Came to the father. The father didn't go out to him. The son had to come to the father. And look what happens when he does. Verse 20, the father saw him, felt compassion, which led him to respond to his son. He ran to meet him, and he received him. And of course, we have the confession as well of the son. Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight, and no more worthy to be called thy son. Think about what he had to do. He had to swallow all of his pride. He had to empty himself. He had to, to be humbled. He, he, again, this is what it means to be poor in spirit, spirit. It takes that, that humility to make such a powerful confession of sin. And the Father received him. We see in verses 22 through 24, we won't read them, but you see in this, these three verses a picture of of reconciliation. 
restoration of a once broken relationship. Who broke the relationship? It wasn't the father. It was the son. Because he went away from the father. And the same holds true for us today. Just as the prodigal had to come home, so too must men come to the father to get day. We must come to him. Again, understanding that God is ready and willing to forgive all. Understanding that God's not the one who has to come to us. We have to come back to God. He's not the one who sinned. We have sinned against Him. I have it in the outline, in your notes. In your spare time, in your personal study, read Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. We're very familiar with that, how sin separates us from God. But also in connection with that, in, in the context dealing with Israel's sins, verse 13, how Isaiah affirms that it, by sinning, that it is we, that it is man who departs from God. And again, we see that picture in the parable here. The prodigal departed from his father. And again, he made that choice. Men make the choice to depart from God by sinning. As a result, it is we who separate ourselves from God. But yet, thanks be unto God, for His great love, His great mercy, His great long-suffering, and that He wants no one to die in the far country of sin. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You think about the, the reaction of God when one soul responds to His gospel, responds to the precious invitation, there's great rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repentance. That's the value of one. We see this beautiful picture of forgiveness here in the parable. Thirdly, God is a providing father. Verses 22 and 23. You think about what the prodigal's father provided him. First of all, think of the shame he felt upon returning home. He left with everything he had. He left wearing... Nice clothes. for He left with money. But you think about how he came home. Came home in tatters. Filthy. Having been in the pig pen. Having been wallowing in the mire with the pigs. Perhaps he felt ashamed. Embarrassed. Humiliated by how he looked. He did not even feel worthy for his father to be called, call him his son. He wanted to be nothing more than a lowly servant. But you think about how the father reacted. Think about his compassion, his love. He provided him with clothing. Verse 22, he told his servants to bring forth the best robe, put it on him, bring, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. He went from filthy rags to clean clothes. Not only that, he provided a feast. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Provided for his physical needs. His starvation, his thirst would be quenched. Then you think about the family and friends that were there. Again, the, 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 the elder brother coming in the, from the field, verse 25, came to out of the house and, he, and he, he heard frolicking, frivolity. The father did that for his son. Did he have to do it? No, he didn't have to do it. He could have said, I told you so. I told you what I could have told you what life was out there, out there was going to be like, but he did not. Treated him with love, with compassion, with grace. Think about what we are provided by with by the by God the Father. You think about the shame of sin. It leaves us spiritually filthy as dirty rags. It leaves us spiritually immodest, spiritually naked. Further, it 
It's a proverbial pig pen. You think about how we should feel about sin. Embarrassed. Ashamed. But yet you think about the condition of our society today. There is no shame for sin, is there? Men are... It, Men call evil good today and good evil, unfortunately. Think about what God has shown towards sinful mankind. Compassion. He made it possible for us, providing things for our salvation through His Son, Jesus the Christ. Making it possible for us to be His children. And as Paul affirms in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, for us to be the son, his sons and daughters. He's given us spiritual clothing, the garments of salvation, robe of righteousness, the sandals of the gospel of peace, the, the ring of adoption or reconciliation, if you will. He's provided us with a spiritual feast that's found through his word. All spiritual blessings that are found only in Christ Jesus. We can enjoy them. He's provided us with a spiritual family, His family, the church of His dear Son, in which we enjoy fellowship, not just with one another, but with God. Oh, how thankful we should be for the provisions that God has provided us with. Tangible provisions for our salvation. Hence, the total picture of the parable that we glean of God is He is a loving Father. Again, we emphasize that He is righteous. He is just. He is holy. He is also loving. Again, that's the total picture of the parable. You think about the love the Father had toward His Son. And you think about the love God has towards us. Love, the motivation for compassion that was shown. Again, God has shown great compassion towards sinful man today in making our salvation from sin possible. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift, the gift of His dear Son, Christ Jesus, who shed its blood on Calvary's tree to make our salvation possible. Hence, the love that loves the motivation for forgiveness. Again, we understand that forgiveness isn't unconditional. It's conditional. God wants to forgive us, but we have to come to Him on His terms. Again, that involves obeying the gospel, hearing the word, believing it, repenting of sin, confessing our faith in Christ, and being baptized into Christ unto the remission of sins. As a Christian, if we sin and fall short, we understand what we must do to, to be forgiven of those sins as well. That's to repent and confess them, pray to God for forgiveness. God, and God will forgive. Let's not doubt that fact. He is faithful and just to forgive. And He wants to forgive because He loves mankind. Love is the motivation for the outpouring of blessings. Again, you think about how the Father in the parable blessed His Son upon returning home. Think about how God blesses those who become His children. They access all spiritual blessings. The blessing of salvation, reconciliation, redemption, fellowship. And we could sit here all night talking about all those spiritual blessings. Again, made possible by the love of God. Love is the motivation for inviting all to come in. You think about how the older son reacted in the parable. He wouldn't go in. He was angry. He, he would not go in, but his father came out. His father invited him to come in. Why are you standing outside? Come on in. God invites all to come to him today. That's why Christ gave his invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor under heavy laden. I will give you rest. Why are you standing outside the fold of safety when you can come and receive rest 
from the one who died for our sins. Love is the motivation for salvation from the far country of sin. Again, as you can see on your lesson, on your handout and on the slide, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. How much did He love the world? He so loved the world. That's an adverb of manner describing the depths of His love. Modifies the verb loved. Not an English major, but I do know what do know, know the verb there in the in its in its modifier. Susan will be proud of me for that. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's the greatest gift. We can't outgive God. Because he gave us his best. Surely we can give our lives to him. Surely understanding that he desires our salvation, all men would want to come out of the far country of sin. Sadly though, there are too many who have hardened their hearts. And those hearts need to be unhardened. Because they're unwilling to climb out of the pig pen. Yes, God is righteous, holy, just, ultimately severe. But again, He is also a good, loving, and gracious God. Certainly His goodness, love, and grace is exemplified here in Luke chapter 15. From the parable we have learned of the goodness of God as Father and that through our choices, which are sometimes bad as the prodigal point demonstrates, they can be used to, to teach us powerful lessons. Prodigal found out the foolishness of life away from home. The hard knocks of life can teach us the foolishness of living a life separate and away from God, which can motivate us to return from the far country of sin. It can motivate us to get ourselves out of sin. But we have to make the choice. He is a father ready and willing to forgive all who seek him and come to him. He's waiting with open arms. He is a Father then who provides for our every need. He knows exactly what we need. He's provided us with all things pertaining to life and godliness. Hence, taken as a whole, He is a loving Father based on the actions demonstrated here in the parable. Tonight, if you're not a child of God, why not become one this evening, through your obedience to the gospel, become a son or daughter of God by way of the new birth tonight. However tonight, if you're not a child of God, if you are, excuse me, but have become prodigal, come to yourself as this son in the parable did. Recognize the error of your way and repent, turn from them, and turn back home to God by rededicating your life to Him this evening. Repenting, confessing your faults, God will joyfully receive you back as well. The invitation is extended. Will you hear it and will you heed it right now as together we stand, as we sing?